Welcome to the Style Blues Podcast. This is where we talk about sewing a beautiful wardrobe and creating a beautiful home. If you have style blues, we can fix it. Your host is Jessica Kramer, apparel designer and blogger at chambrayblues.com. Listen in and let your blues disappear. Welcome to episode one of the Style Blues podcast. Thanks for being here. My name is Jessica Kramer. I'm your host, and we're going to have all kinds of fun with this podcast. I'm really excited. This has been something on my mind for about the last year, and it's finally coming to fruition, and I'm so excited that you're here with me today. So I wanted to talk a little bit about who I am and kind of the background behind it. For the last eight years, I have been writing on my decor blog, Designer Sweet Spot, which you can find at designersweetspot.com. And from the very beginning when I started blogging, I kind of had a vision for almost two separate things that I wanted to accomplish with the blog. One of them was the home decor website where you could see all kinds of great DIY projects and tutorials. And the other one was a fashion brand uh, because that is my background uh, in apparel design and home sewing patterns. And I've wanted to do this for many, many years since I graduated from college a long time ago. And for the first probably four years, five years on the blog, I just focused primarily on home decor and things related to the home, which is going to be part of the podcast as well, which I'm happy to say because I still love home decor. I love decorating, painting, furniture, and all kinds of things like that, and I have lots of tips and stories to share with you. But I also wanted to get back into my origin with the apparel design, and I thought I'd start by telling you a little bit about how I got into that field in the first place. So I grew up in a small town in Wisconsin way back when, and we didn't have department stores. We had one tiny shop where we could go and buy clothing to wear and their sizing was very limited and the styles they had were you know very um, small amount of things to offer and that's where most people shopped but we had some size issues in our household my sister was very tall and I was short and rather round or shorter I should say than she was and so we had a hard time finding things that that worked for us we did, however, have a fabric store in our small town. It was a great little family-run shop. You could go in there and find any kind of fabric for any project. There was always someone there to help you pick things out, give you selection choices. You know, if you're looking for, we were looking for a swimsuit or whatnot, they could help us find the right fabric and help us pick out even the pattern to go with it. And then we would take our fabrics and patterns and things to a seamstress in town. Her name was Mrs. Kloss, and she was absolutely amazing. She would measure us and make a few notes on the back of the envelope, and then she'd say, okay, come back on Tuesday, and we'd arrive back at her house a few days later, and she'd have this amazing garment ready for you that just fit fantastic, and we literally wore those things until they were rags because I just loved them so much and they fit so well. Back then we didn't have problems with shrinkage and uh, quality issues that we have today when you go to a retail shop to buy something to wear. So after a number of years of being with Mrs. Klaus, eventually she retired and we had to drive an hour uh, to the closest shopping mall or department store where we could find something to wear. So somewhere along the line, I had a friend who was interested in sewing, and I remember her wearing this beautiful calico vest with a t-shirt and jeans one day, and I said, oh, I just love your vest, and where did you find it? I'd love to get one, and she said, well, I made it, and she said, well, it's a really easy pattern, it's really easy to make, I'll make you one, and I said, well, I'd rather that you teach me to make one. 
and that was how I got my start. My first sewing project was a little bitty two-piece pattern for a very simple vest. I learned to sew on a 1929 Singer machine with a treadle where you had to uh, move your feet back and forth to to sew. It was not an electric machine. It was a, a treadle machine where you pump the pedal. They're still around in antique stores today. And I was hooked at that time. I just, I loved it. And I, from then on, looked for things to sew whenever I could. So by the time I was in high school, I was sewing most of my own clothes. And uh, people didn't really know what to do with me. I'd look through uh, Vogue magazines. During the summertime, my grandmother had a friend who gave her all of her old Vogue magazines. And I would page through them and rip out pages and find styles that I liked. And I would sew them for my school wardrobe for the following year. And I'd had friends at school who were, just didn't understand. They just thought it was horrible that I sewed my own clothes. Like, why in the world would I do that? And it's so much work. And, it, you know, they call me Becky Homecky and horrible names. Kids can be so brutal when they want to be. But I didn't care. I, I enjoyed it, and I still do. So I ended up uh, going off to school and, and majoring in apparel design. Uh, I went to FIT for part of my schooling in New York City. Uh, the Fashion Institute is really well known today with the Project Runway and its wonderful success. And it's um, a great school. It was a good experience being there. At the time, um, you know, no one knew about FIT. No one knew what it was or what they had to offer. It was really uh, not very well known other than in the um, design circles. And after that, I, I worked for a couple different companies. One is a lingerie designer and the other um, with a company that manufactured all kinds of different apparel. And I worked in quality assurance. So I kind of have a different viewpoint, I guess, because something that's well made is not the same as something that, you know, comes out of a low end department store where they're trying to stay in budget. So all these things kind of come together and I'm looking forward to sharing my knowledge with you and I'm hoping to have some great guests on the show, some people, contacts that I have in the industry. Still, I think it'd be really a lot of fun to talk about the way things work and learn more about the sewing industry and teach you how to sew your own wardrobe. It's a very rewarding thing. Years ago, it was something everybody knew how to do. And it's just sort of a lost skill today. I had a friend of mine tell me that when she was in high school, way back when, everybody sewed their own clothes. It was not unusual. And now it's just people are kind of looking to learn new things, looking to figure these things out. I personally think the quality of things in the stores today is really, really bad. And the fabrics can be thin and they shrink and they don't fit and just overall there's a lot of quality problems that perhaps I see and other people don't see but you know what they are because that's why we kind of have a disposable society as far as clothing goes. You see pictures on Facebook of giant pallets full of garments that are just waste. And the reason they're so wasteful is because they're so poorly made and people don't like them. They don't last. They don't wear them long enough. They wear out before they should. And that can all be changed with some good knowledge and sewing skills. So that's kind of the vision for the sewing end of the podcast. And now I want to cover just a few things that you might not know if you so or not, about how you can, 10 hurdles that you can overcome by sewing your own clothes. Ready? Here we go. Number one, you can do it. It's not that hard. It's not rock and science. It's just fabric and a machine. You versus the machine and you can win. I can teach you that. There are little things, little red flags 
about sewing machines that once you know what they are, it makes everything so much easier. And the same with the fabric. If you're sewing something and it's not working out, if your seams are puckering or the tension isn't right, or it's one thing or the other. It's either the fabric, something you haven't done with the fabric or done incorrectly, or it's the machine. It's not the user. User is very rarely at fault. And that's just a mindset you have to get over. You can do this. People have sewn their own clothes for decades, centuries even. And they're beautiful. If you go into the Smithsonian and look at their costume exhibit, they are amazing garments that have lasted a couple hundred years. And you can do that. You can make an amazing garment that's beautifully made, high quality, that'll last for a really long time. It just takes practice and a little bit of know-how, and that's what we're going to learn. So number two, always pre-wash your fabric. This is a huge beginning sewing mistake that I see people make all the time. You have to pre-wash your fabrics. When you're in the fabric store, those fabrics have been through a lot of manufacturing and finishing processes. They have layer after layer of stuff, chemical stuff, sprayed on them in order to get them smooth and flat and color fast and all those things. And when you sew with them without washing, you're going to run into problems. Some fabrics shrink as much as 20%. 20% is huge, especially if you're making a garment. That's a huge reason why things may not fit after you wash them is because you didn't pre-wash your materials. Some fabrics, such as flannel, can shrink even more than 20%. In fact, it's recommended that you wash and dry flannel three times before using it. Three times in order to get it to shrink down and be a solid material before you cut it. That's a huge difference. So always pre-wash your fabric. It's really important. Now in quilting, they do things a little bit differently. We'll get to that down the road. But for apparel sewing, it's really important that you wash your fabrics. The only exception would be dry cleanables. For example, a fine velvet or a fine silk that you would take to the dry cleaner. Those things you don't have to dry clean beforehand because they will not shrink. Dry cleaning um, does not cause shrinkage. Okay, so moving on. Number three, the third thing you can do is to always keep your thread on the machine consistent. So that what I mean by that is the thread that you use on the top of the machine should always match the thread in the bottom. It's a huge problem if they are different. Most machines are very sensitive to the gauge of the thread, the diameter of the thread, and it can cause problems. You also might have one thread that's stronger than the other. Uh, it can cause breakage, <clears throat> and that can cause, you know, broken threads inside the machine, can cause knots, get stuck in the parts, and just make everything a big mess. So that's a big tip for beginner sewers. Always use the same thread on the top and under um, underneath in the bobbin. Very important. Number four, start with a new needle. It's amazing how we forget to change needles on the machine. There are needles for many different type of fabrics that make your sewing so much easier. For example, if you're sewing something heavy like denim, you heat, need to use a denim needle, and they are clearly marked on the package. For most general purposes, for mid-weight to lightweight fabrics, cottons, just an all-purpose needle will work. If you are doing specialty sewing, such as knits, you need a ballpoint needle, which is a, a rounded needle that doesn't get caught in the fabric. Because if you're sewing with a regular needle, it can catch and cause runs in the fabric and basically just make a mess out of your garment and damage the fabric. There are needles for, of course, different stitches as well. If you're doing, say, a double needle top stitch, 
obviously you need to have a double needle for that. Just be aware that there are different needles for different types of projects and make sure that you have the right kind of needle for your project. Number five, read the pattern envelope. This sounds incredibly simple and it is simple if you remember to do it. So some of the biggest problems I find when I teach people how to sew is that they're using a pattern size that's not correct for them. So ready to wear sizes that you would go and buy in a department store are not the same as the pattern envelope sizes. They're just not, especially in women's wear. Now men's is, wear is a little bit different because men's wear sizing is based off of actual measurements. So and as women, we are determined not to use our actual me measurements for anything. And our uh, lovely apparel manufacturers know that, so that's why they choose to just list our sizes as size 10, 12, 14. It has nothing to do with our actual measurements. So on the back of the pattern envelope, it's usually on the flap of the envelope, you will find body measurements. So you need to take your basic measurements, such as bust, waist, hip, and compare them to the sizes on the envelope so that you buy the right size pattern. When in doubt, if you're between sizes, I would go one size larger. It's easy to take in fabric a little bit if it's a little bit too big. However, if it's small, if you're uh, buying a smaller size pattern and your measurements are actually a little bit larger, it's harder to get that right. It's harder to alter and increase the size of the pattern and increase the fabric with enough consistency that it still looks good. And we'll talk about um, those kinds of techniques as we go along here too in the podcast. But just make sure that you have the right size for your measurements. Now, one other thing about menswear is that obviously men have chest, waist, and hip measurements. They also have sleeve lengths that are measured from the center back neck. So if you hold up a tape measure at the very center of your neck and pull it down your arm, stick your arm straight out from your body, pull the, me the measuring tape all the way down your arm and just kind of curve your arm a little bit, you want to measure all the way to the wrist bone and that will give you your arm length. So when you go to a nice gentleman's store and buy a dress shirt, for example, that's how they measure for the sleeve length for dress shirts. And maybe most guys understand that, but us ladies don't always go to those kinds of places. We don't necessarily know this. So when you're looking at doing alterations for sleeve length, that's how we would calculate what your sleeve length needs to be. Add up the measurement between the back neck to the shoulder and then add in the sleeve itself from the sleeve cap all the way to the wrist and if there's a cuff that will add a couple more inches on there so you need to add that in with the rest of it in order to get the proper measurement. They don't usually have sleeve lengths on the envelopes but it's good to be aware that that's how it's done. Um, there may be some patterns that would list that but it seems to me it's usually just bust, waist, and hip measurements. Number six, remove the selvages of your fabric before you begin. This is really basic tip, but I see it all the time. Beginning sewers tend to leave the selvages on their fabric when they cut their garments and sometimes even use it, like for a side seam. That does not work. And the reason is this. So in manufacturing, the fabric is held tight in the loom by the selvages. And if you don't know what a selvage is, it's the edges, horizontal edges of the fabric, not the fold, the other part, across from the fold. These are tight, tightly woven. And even though it seems like a good idea to keep there because it doesn't unravel and it kind of looks like a finished edge, it's not. It actually is one of the reasons that your seams can pucker and not turn out. They need to be removed. It's only about a half an inch 
It's not a waste to remove it, and it allows the fabric to just move and shape as it needs to, to go around the body. It's a flat, straight edge, and you can't shape it properly to your body without removing it. So always remove the salvages. The big mistake that I see beginning sewers make. Number seven, be sure the grain line is parallel to the fold when cutting. This is a huge thing. So on every pattern piece, there is a grain line. And it's easy to think you have it straight when it's really not. So when I was in school years ago, one of the things that I had thought was a big mystery of sewing was how to get the garments to hang straight. Because every once in a while, I would sew something and it looked great and I'd put it on and then it would twist and it would be crooked. And the reason for that, I learned, was because the grain line wasn't perfectly straight. Well, how do you tell if it's straight? So when you're laying out your pattern, you need to measure the distance between the grain line marking and the fold of the fabric, both ends of the marking. So on, say, a pants pattern, you might have a grain line arrow that's maybe 12 inches. You need to measure the distance between the fold and one end of that grain line, and then again between the fold and the other end of the grain line. Because if it's off, even by a quarter of an inch, it will make a huge difference in your garment. It will not hang properly, it will not fit properly, and you'll be really frustrated. So that's a big thing for beginning sewers, and we'll have um, video tutorials and things as we go along in the group. I also have a Facebook group set up called Chambray Blues Patterns and Tutorials. Uh, Chambray Blues is my pattern shop where I sell the patterns that I design for both home and apparel. And we have a Facebook group where we can share our questions and share our successes in there. You can post pictures of things that you've made or things that you're struggling with you shoot me a picture of your pattern, uh, your directions, and where you're at. If you're confused, I'd be happy to help you out with that. So it's a great community, and you can find it at Facebook backslash Chambray Blues Sewing Patterns and Tutorials Groups dot com. So make sure and join. And uh, in 2018, we are going to start with a sew along, a monthly project which I'm really looking forward to. We're going to do some great things. I have plans to cover a bunch of different types of sewing. We're going to start with some ready-to-wear and do some lingerie and some dresses, um, maybe even get into some tailoring techniques towards the end of the year. So you don't want to miss out on any of that. And we'll have uh, video demonstrations of a lot of these things that I'm talking about here. If you're a new sewer and um, doesn't quite come together for you yet, it will. So make sure and find us in the group. Okay, moving on. Number eight, service your sewing machine. This is so important. If you have a machine that was been a hand down or something you've got in a thrift store or it's your mother's machine, or it could be that the reason they gave it to you was because it wasn't working. If you have not had it serviced in the last year, you need to take it in right now. It is really important and it costs you only a few dollars, probably $30, $40 to have it serviced to make sure everything's working the way it should. It's a huge thing to have a machine that's in good working order. It doesn't matter if it's a used machine. These used machines work great for the most part. And it doesn't have to be a brand new fancy machine, but it does have to be in good working order. If you're not sure how to work the machine, uh, someone in the sewing shop can help you with that. They can show you how to thread it. They can show you how to put the bobbin in. They can show you how to change the needle. Just basic things that you may not know if you don't have a manual. Of course, a lot of people we can look things up uh, online too. You know, if you have a Singer 190, you can search for the manual online 
and find it and even video tutorials of what to do with the machine that's not working. But it's really important that it gets regular service if you're going to do any kind of serious sewing. Number nine, you don't need to have a million different machines unless you sew professionally. I have seen so many postings about people who want to buy embroidery machines or more expensive home sewing machines that have different stitches or cover stitch machines and all of that is great but it's fluff. Honestly for basic home sewing if you just sew occasionally you don't need a really expensive machine. I have a Singer 190, I believe is the, the model number. It's a newer machine, probably four years old, but it has a great variety of stitches on it. I can sew just about anything. I can overcast um, like I would with a cover stitch machine. I can sew knits. I can sew lingerie. I can sew you know, wool and quilts and all kinds of things. And it's really a, a good good basic machine to have, especially if you are just starting out. I can leave a link in the show notes um, to the machine that I have. If you're interested, you can look at that. Uh, my other machine that I have is this Ancient Elna, which I bought 27 years ago. And it's uh, a serger. It's a five-thread serger. And you know what? I hardly ever use it. It is so hard to thread it and keep it in good working order. Honestly, it's been sitting in a closet for years because it's just so much easier to use a basic sewing machine. So if you have a surgery, that's great. It's great if you can figure out how to use it. The newer ones are, of course, better than the older machines because they have air threading where the thread machine basically threads itself and you don't have to figure it out. Um, they can be very complicated, but it's also kind of expensive to use a serger because you have to buy five cones of thread for your project. And uh, between that and the time that it takes to work with the machine, it's not always worth it. So definitely do not have to have a fancy machine in order to be successful with sewing projects. Number 10 is don't get frustrated. If you're a beginning sewer, it takes time to develop the skill. And you're not going to be doing everything 100% right off the bat. That's just how it is. With like anything else, it takes practice. And the more you practice, the better you get at it. That's just how it is. Commercial patterns especially can be hard to understand. Once you understand the lingo and the vocabulary, things tend to go along a lot smoother. And we're going to go over basic things like that here in the podcast and in the video tutorials because they're just can be really a block for people who are just starting out and think that they can't do it or maybe their garment doesn't turn out right and they don't know why. It just takes practice. And I have some patterns that I've sewn two or three times before I really got them to come out well and really like the result. And I sew a lot. I've been sewing for so many years. So it's a huge, huge thing to just have confidence in yourself. You can do this. You're learning. Don't let unkind words from other people bring you down or make you lose encouragement because you can do this and we can help. So that's all I have for today. Thanks for stopping by. You made it through the first podcast. Yay. And there will be many more. I will see you next time. You can find me on my home decor blog at designersweetspot.com. That's designersweetspot.com. And my pattern shop is chambrayblues.com. I'm on Facebook. If you need to send me a question, if you'd like to leave me a review on iTunes, I would love that. Love to know how I'm doing. Also, if you have any suggestions or Topics that you would like covered in the podcast, shoot me an email at info at designersweetspot.com and I would happy, be happy to hear from you. Thanks so much for stopping by. Have a great day. We'll talk to you next week.
Bye. You are listening to the Style Blues Podcast. If you have questions about this episode, you can contact us by email, info at chambrayblues.com, or visit our Chambray Blues Sewing Patterns and Tutorials Facebook page and group. Don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes. Until next time, style those blues. <laughs>